Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. This is the second video for the topic of linear algebra and we'll move into a little bit more of the advanced formulation of linear algebra. What we learned last time was that we could generalize the notion of vectors and if we included certain rules for the operations vector addition and scalar multiplication, we could have a new definition for vectors which was a superset of the original definition. One of the examples I took for the new definition of vectors was column matrices. Let's say you have 2, 3 and 7 and let's say you have another one 6, 1 and 4. These can be added according to the familiar rules of vector addition, can be multiplied by a scalar according to the rules of scalar multiplication and so these column matrices form vector and a vector space. For the inner product, we need to define that so that these form the familiar rules and the inner product between these two vectors would be defined as if this is alpha and this is beta, then alpha inner product with beta would be, we would take the transposition of this and then it would be 2, 7 and 3 multiplied by this. So we would have 2 into 6 plus 3 into 1 plus 7 into 4, which basically would be 2, 3, 7 multiplied by 6, 1, 4. And it's not just a coincidence that I kept using column vectors as an example of the vector space because column vectors essentially are quantum mechanical states. They are quantum mechanical states for the finite dimensional cases which we did in infinite square well and harmonic oscillator where you have a finite number of basic states and you can form a state as a linear combination of them. And another important thing is whenever you have a column matrix and you multiply it by an actual matrix, let's say you have 2, 1, 3, 6, 1, 4, 7, 2, 9 and you multiply it by 3, 1, 7, you get another column matrix. So when you multiply a column matrix by a matrix that is a square matrix, you get another column matrix. And this multiplication of a column matrix by a square matrix is what in the quantum mechanical formulation is the measurement. This would represent the state and when you multiply it by a matrix, you're basically doing a measurement or you're operating on that state and it gives you a new state. So this is the relationship between quantum mechanics. We'll explore that once we do the formalism of quantum mechanics. But this should tell you why the study of matrix is important because a matrix refers to measurement or what in the language of quantum mechanics and linear algebra is called the linear transformation. So this will be the formalism we'll see in quantum mechanics. There will, there will be other cases as well, but for the basic case, we would have the state that will be represented by a column matrix. When we need to measure something on a particle in that state, we would change the state inevitably. That is the difference between quantum and classical mechanics. So a measurement or an operation can be represented by a matrix. And when you operate that on a state, you get a new state. Now, there can be many different types of operations. Let's say you take a vector in three-dimensional space and you multiply it by five. So every vector is multiplied by a five. That will be a transformation where every vector will give you a new vector. Or if you rotate every vector, that would be a transformation. And the fact is that if you have a column matrix and you need a new column matrix, you can always choose the elements of this matrix such that the new matrix is given. So for every single initial state going to final state, the transformation can be represented by a matrix. Now why is it called linear transformation? Because one of the rules for quantum mechanics is that observables represented by linear transformation. A linear transformation basically means that T now, I'll represent this is a slight change of notation. I'll represent the operators or the matrices by a hat on them because that is the general formalism in quantum mechanics. This times a vector A alpha plus B beta can be represented as A times T of alpha plus B times T of beta. In any transformation, if this rule is followed, it is called a linear transformation. And a linear transformation is important because then you can, once you have the simple set of bases and the transformation for that basis, you can get the transformation for any vector once you know the n-tuple of that vector in the standard basis. 
So let's say you have a linear transformation T hat and you know what it does to the basis vectors E1, E2, dot, 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 En. We know what it does, so let's see what it does. Let's say T when it goes to E1, changes E1 and gives you a new vector. Now, because E1, E2, En is considered to be an orthonormal basis, every single vector can be represented as a linear combination of these bases. So the new vector to the transformed E1 can again be represented as a linear combination of E1, E2, En. Let's write it as T11, E1, plus T21, E2, plus dot, 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 plus TN1, En. And then you would have T going on to E2, and that would give you T12 times E1 plus T22 times En plus dot 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 plus Tn2 times En. And you get the result like that for every basis. So T times En will be T1n E1 plus T two N E two plus dot 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 till T N N E N. So let's say we know the terms T one one, T two one, T one two, T two two, and so on. We know these n square terms, meaning we know what the transformation does to each of the basis vectors. That means if you have a vector which is a linear combination of these vectors, let's say alpha, which is a one E one plus a2 e2 plus dot 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 plus a n e n then you would know what this vector becomes when it is transformed by the operator t or the matrix t because you know what it does to e1 e2 and e n and you this is a linear combination and it is indeed a linear transformation so you can use the standard rule of linear transformation to get it for any vector alpha so let's see what it is. The mathematics gets a little formidable, but we need to know that so that we finally understand why matrices are important for linear transformations. So T times alpha. And now I'll use summation. It will basically be summation J is equal to 1 to N. AJ, whatever A1, A1 plus A2, A2 plus A3, A3 is times T into EJ. Right, And that can be represented as, because T we already know when it transforms on Ej, what it does, we already know the n relations which we wrote in the previous case, this can be written as summation i is equal to 1 to n, and then you have the inside summation j is equal to 1 to n t i j times a j into e i. So what we've done is T times Ej we've represented as summation i is equal to n T i j times E i and then we've interchanged the two summations. And from this what we can see is the new transformed vector is also a linear combination of E i but this value which initially was A i A j has changed so the new A i dash for the transformed vector is equal to summation j is equal to 1 to n T i j times A j. So this tells us that if we know how a linear transformation acts on the basis, we know how a linear transformation acts on any vector which is a linear combination of those bases. And since every vector is a linear combination of bases, we know how the linear transformation acts on every vector. And so there are total n square elements, t11, t12, t21, t22, up to tnn, and we can represent in them in the form of a matrix. So t can be represented as T11, T12, T1n, T21, T22, T2n, and Tn1, Tn2, till Tnn. But there's another reason we can represent a matrix like this because there are many advantages to matrix formulation because we already know how the arithmetic of matrix works. So let's say you have two transformations, let's say S and T. And the sum of those transformations works on alpha. You can simply write it as S of alpha 
plus t of alpha right because it's a linear transformation and so these two sums will basically be the sum of each of these components so when you have transformation u which is let's say s plus t then if you know the matrices for s and t you know the matrix for u which is basically given as uij is equal to sij plus tij Another reason we can use transformation, and I'll not go into the mathematics of this completely, I'll not give you a proof of this, but if you have, let's say, a transformation alpha dash, which is equal to t times alpha, and then you have a transformation what s times this, so alpha double dash will be s times alpha dash, then it can be written as s times t of alpha, and this is basically s t of alpha right now if you write this in terms of summation and actually calculate what this comes out to be you will see that s t will give you the thing which you get by the rules of matrix multiplication essentially what you'll get this will be equal to u which will tell you that u i k is equal to summation j is equal to 1 to n s i j t j k which means the i -th row and the k -th row you just take the product of them and this we know is the standard rule for matrix multiplication so this once again gives you a real benefit of using matrices as linear transformations if you take a vector alpha and you transform it with t you get alpha dash and you do another linear transformation s then it is the same as doing the transformation S into T, where S into T is basically the matrix multiplication of the matrix S and the matrix T. So what we've done, all of this culminates into one small result, which is what we've been looking for so far. When you have alpha dash, that is equal to T times alpha, that can simply be represented as the vector A, a dash is equal to t times the vector a and now these were two vectors and this was a linear transformation here this is a column matrix this is a column matrix and this is a standard square matrix so what we've done is whenever we have the vectors which are represented by row and column matrices the linear transformation will be represented by a square matrix when you have two transformations in succession the net transformation will be consistent with the rules of matrix multiplication if this wasn't true everything would crumble and we would not be able to formulate the mathematics based on matrices so essentially the language of linear algebra in quantum mechanics is matrices and column vectors so now our task would be to learn a little bit more about matrices i'll just quickly give you a few definitions of matrices which you probably know the first that there is the transposition of a matrix which is represented as T transformation or if you look at the matrix A then A transposition is basically in, in A you would have A11, A12, A13 here you would have A11, A21, A31 till AN1 and here you would have A12 till a1n you already know what this is you basically reflect the vector about the main diagonal if you have vector instead of a matrix or represented like this and this is equal to a11 so a1 a2 till an instead of a square matrix then the transposition will be a column matrix a1 a2 till an so for a row matrix, the transposition is a column matrix. For a square matrix, the transposition is uh, reflecting it about the main diagonal. And the definition of a square matrix is symmetric if A is equal to A transpose. Of course, that can only happen for a square matrix, not for a row or column matrix. And it is called anti-symmetric. if a is equal to the negative of a transpose and this will again come in use later because i just told you that linear transformations can be represented by matrices but if the matrix representing a linear transformation is symmetric then it is a special type of a matrix which represents an observable so the theory of linear algebra ultimately boils down to matrices and so you need to know the definitions for matrices quite well then you can have the complex conjugate of a matrix A star, which basically will be A11 star 
a1 2 star and so on till a1 n star a n 1 star and here you'll have a n n star and if you have a vector like this then a star will simply be a1 star a2 star till a n star and remember another big difference between what we are doing now and what you've done in vectors in previous classes would be there the scalars which were associated with vectors were always real numbers now the scalars a1 a2 n3 can be complex numbers as well and finally you have a combination of these the combination of the transpose and the conjugate which is referred to as the Hermitian. And this is the thing that is of most use when it comes to the quantum mechanical linear transformation. And a Hermitian is basically the transpose conjugate. So if you have a matrix A, which is equal to A11, A12, A1n, A21, AN1, ANN. Then the Hermitian is represented by a dagger. This is called a dagger. And this is basically first you transpose it and then you take the complex conjugate. So this will be A11 star, A21 star, AN1 star, A12 star till a 1 n star and here you would have a n n star. So the Hermitian is basically the transpose conjugate that means you take the transpose and then you take the conjugate. And then a matrix is referred to as a Hermitian matrix if a is equal to a dagger and a matrix is referred to as a skew Hermitian matrix if a is equal to minus a dagger. And what we'll see once we get to the formalism of quantum mechanics is every single observable, every single thing that you can observe like position, momentum and so on will be represented in terms of Hermitian matrices. Not just matrices, but they would have to be a special kind of matrix for Hermitian matrices. Now there are a couple of other definitions when it comes to matrices which are important. The first is the commutator. And this is something we've already seen for operators when we did quantum mechanics. Now we see it in terms of matrices. The commutator of two matrices S and T is basically ST minus TS. And we need the commutator because matrix multiplication is not commutative. ST is not equal to TS. So this will be the difference between them. Then you have the rules for the transposition and hermation. If you have S and T and you take the transpose of this, that will basically be T transpose S transpose. And you, if you have S multiplied by T and you take the Hermitian conjugate of this, once again it will give you the same result T Hermitian conjugate times S Hermitian conjugate. So you have to take them in reverse order. Then you have what is called the unit matrix. Now this is where some students make a little bit of a mistake. They think of it as a matrix which has 1 everywhere but it's not true. It has 1 on the main diagonal and 0 everywhere else. And the reason that needs to be true is that only then when you multiply a unit matrix by a row vector, you get the row vector itself. If you take it to be 1 everywhere and you multiply it with a row vector, you will not get the row vector itself. So this is essentially the identity matrix. So this completes most of the mathematical formulation that we needed for quantum mechanics. But now what is left is the bread and butter of quantum mechanics, the way you actually solve problems. And that is one of the most important concepts in matrices and something you've probably seen before, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now consider a matrix which represents a linear transformation T. Now if T acts on a vector alpha, it will give us a new vector in general. But there might be certain specific values of alpha for which the new vector, when you apply this linear transformation T, is a linear multiple of the original vector. So it is let's say lambda times alpha. This situation is called the eigenvector equation and alpha for such a linear transformation is called the eigenvector 
and lambda is called the eigenvalue. So for most matrices these values exist, a certain vector for which when you multiply the matrix by that vector, all you get is a linear multiple of that vector. The importance of these will be seen, right now we'll just try to solve the mathematics of this. So what we do is, this can be represented as if you take it to the left side, T minus lambda I, where I is the identity matrix or the unit matrix, alpha is equal to zero. Right. Now, if we write it in terms of the matrices, vectors, this alpha can be represented as a column matrix A. And T minus lambda I times the matrix A. This is a matrix, this is a vector, is equal to zero. Now, the equation for this is an equation such that the determinant of T minus lambda I is equal to zero. Because that is the only way you can get a non-zero value of a, yet this result being true, if the determinant of t minus lambda i is zero. And what is t minus lambda i? It will be equal to t and lambda i will be lambda times the unitary matrix, which is lambda on every value of the diagonal. So t minus lambda i is basically t11 minus lambda, t12, t13 and so on t21, but here you'll have t22 minus lambda, and so on, and finally you'll have tnn minus lambda. So it will basically be the same matrix T, except every single diagonal element will be subtracted by a value of lambda. And if you take the determinant of this to be zero, you can get the value of lambda. And this is how you solve for the eigenvalue of a matrix. Again, I repeat, the importance of this, the physical importance of this, as opposed to the mathematical importance, will be seen once we get to quantum mechanics. But right now, we can see that this is how you solve the equation for the eigenvalues. This will give you a polynomial in lambda, which is called the characteristic equation. And you put that equal to zero, you'll get the value of lambda. Once you get the values of lambda, and there might be many different values, because this will be a polynomial, then for each value of lambda, will you calculate alpha by substituting this back into the equation and calculating the value of alpha. So that is how you get the eigenvectors. Now the set of all the eigenvalues is called the spectrum of the matrix. And one thing more to note here is that if alpha is an eigenvector, so is 2 times alpha, or 5 times alpha, or 10 times alpha, because the only thing that will change, both sides will be multiplied by a scalar. So if alpha is an eigenvector, so is any multiple of alpha, but when you have two linearly independent vectors, that is important, not two vectors, because you can always find two linearly dependent vectors, one which is a linear multiple of the other, but whenever you have two linearly independent eigenvectors, which have the same eigenvalue, then the spectrum is said to be degenerate. So calculating the eigenvectors and eigenvalues is quite simple. If you have the matrix T, you just write the equation T times the eigenvector alpha is equal to lambda times alpha. You take this to the left side, and the only solution to this possible equation is the determinant of T minus lambda i is zero. But in that equal to zero, you get a polynomial in lambda, which means you get different values of lambda. For each value of lambda, you can calculate alpha itself. I'll not show you an example of how to do this, but you can get it for yourself. Just take a random matrix, or you can check it in any textbook, and calculate first the eigenvalues of the matrix, and then the eigenvectors. Now, when this becomes really useful, is when you're talking about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a Hermitian matrix. So Hermitian transformations or Hermitian matrices have this property that if you have alpha with t times beta, this is basically the inner product of alpha and t times beta, then it can either be represented as alpha times t beta or it can also be represented as t dagger times alpha in a product with beta. This is a property of all Hermitian matrices as long as t is Hermitian. Hermitian, we already saw, is when t dagger is equal to t. 
or the transpose conjugate of T is the same as T. Now, for these Hermitian matrices, you have two very special relations which form really the backbone of the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. One is that the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix are real. And this should make sense because every time we measure something on the state, we should get a real value. When you measure the position, when you measure the momentum, when you measure the kinetic energy, you should get a real value because a complex number would make no sense. So let's see the proof of this. Let's say lambda is an eigenvalue of t and alpha is an eigenvector. Then alpha times t alpha can be written as alpha times lambda alpha because that is the property of eigenvalues t alpha is equal to lambda alpha and lambda can come outside so lambda alpha times alpha but this can be also written as t dagger alpha times alpha but t dagger is equal to t if it is a Hermitian matrix so this is equal to t alpha times alpha which is equal to lambda alpha times alpha and now we know that the inner product is not commutative a into b is not the same as b into a but it is the complex conjugate of b into a so here you would have lambda star times alpha with alpha so we get lambda alpha with alpha is equal to lambda star alpha with alpha which tells us that lambda is equal to lambda star from which we have proved the, the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix is always real. So whenever you measure something corresponding to a Hermitian matrix, you should get a real value. The other important property is that the eigenvectors, and this is again true only for a Hermitian matrix, belonging to distinct eigenvalues, are orthogonal. And the fact that they belong to distinct eigenvalues is important because for the same eigenvalue, if alpha is an eigenvector, so is 10 times alpha and we are not talking about those. If we have two different eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors belonging to the two different eigenvalues are orthogonal. And let's see the proof of that. So let's say for a matrix T, a Hermitian matrix, we have two different eigenvectors, eigenvalues lambda and mu, corresponding to two different eigenvectors. So T times alpha is equal to lambda alpha, and let's say T times beta is equal to mu times beta. And we are looking for alpha times T into beta. And that can be written as alpha times mu into beta, and since mu is a scalar, it can come out. So is equal to mu times alpha with beta. But similarly, this can also be written as T dagger alpha times beta. And since T dagger is equal to T, this is equal to T alpha times beta, where T alpha is the linear transformation on alpha. And this obviously from this equation can be written as lambda alpha with beta and once again like in the previous case lambda star will come outside so is equal to lambda star alpha with beta and lambda star is equal to lambda we already know which tells us that lambda alpha with beta is equal to mu alpha with beta and we already know that lambda and mu are different because we are talking about eigenvectors belonging to distinct eigenvalues so if lambda is not equal to mu, the only solution is alpha with beta is equal to zero, which means alpha and beta are mutually orthogonal vectors. There's another property which we'll not prove and it is beyond the scope of this course, which is that the eigenvectors, when you talk about Hermitian transformation, they span the space. Spanning the space means every other vector can be represented as a linear combination of those eigenvectors. And this is finally why you see 
that eigenvectors and eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are so important and you might be able to see some connections with the things we've done earlier. For example, when we talked about an infinite square well, every single independent state, linearly independent state was mutually orthogonal. And that was because they will basically form eigenvectors of the linear transformation and once again we also proved that they have to be mutually orthogonal. There we proved it using just the specific values of the states. Here we proved it generally that whenever you have a Hermitian matrix, and by the way, H psi is equal to E psi. This is basically an eigenvalue equation. E is the scalar which is the eigenvector, H is the linear transformation which is Hermitian which we'll prove later. So where H is a linear transformation, you get let's say two different size for two different values of E, then uh, the values of E will all be real, that was what we proved in the first case, and the two different psi will be mutually orthogonal, that means their inner product will be zero, which is again what we proved for the specific infinite square well case. So this completes the pure mathematics we needed for linear algebra, and now in the next video we'll go back to the formalism and apply these mathematical rules to the familiar things which we know already, such as states of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation and so on, and we'll put all of that into a much more elegant formulation so that future more advanced problems such as the hydrogen atom can be solved much more elegantly as opposed to in the ad hoc way we've done up till now. Thank you.